I am an avid gardener. By now, folks should have figured out that I'm a country girl at heart, and my dream is to one day own a ranch-style house on several acres of land where I can plant a nice-sized, sustainable garden year-round with the help of a greenhouse or two and have a little lake stocked with fishes and have some horses to ride and some sheep to herd and maybe to shear for their comfy wool, have some chickens to lay some eggs for breakfast and quiches and frittatas, and have an ATV to ride around the expanse on with a few unruly but friendly dogs chasing behind. Now, of course, I'll have plenty of room for the comrades to come and relax and rejuvenate and organize, obviously. I'll probably have annual retreats and conferences, and I'll probably have a bunch of weekends where the neighbor kids can come and learn to tend the critters and plant stuff. But I love the land and I love the soil and the woods and nature. And the more this year drags on, the less I actually like people. And that dream of mine gets more and more critical in needing to make it happen for me. Learning about the way evacuees from Hurricane Sally are being treated right now in New Orleans broke my heart because it did sound like Hurricane Katrina all over again. And I barely recovered from that. Not that I was there or that I was an evacuee myself. You see, I worked for a government contractor at the time and I was on a civilian contract that manned the phones for the Red Cross when it stood up its call center to respond to Katrina victims in need of assistance. Now, the contractor, of course, hired call center staff, but we employees could volunteer if we wanted to. We didn't get anything extra for it. It was just an opportunity to do some good. And I'm that type of person. So I jumped at the opportunity. I remember the Red Cross call center manager coming to talk to us about it. And I recall this man being the most tired looking man I'd seen probably in my life. And he said to us in a low, serious and very sad tone of voice, he said, listen, if you do this, I'm not going to recommend that you do it for more than a week at a time. You're going to need to take some days away from it. These are very difficult calls to take and they will stick with you. We're so glad you're volunteering, but do not take this lightly. People are suffering and you're going to hear that firsthand. That was an incredible understatement. I volunteered three nights a week for four weeks, taking a week and sometimes two off in between. I talked to people who had lost their children in the storm, had their babies slip out of their arms in the current as they tried to wade through the chest high water to safety. I talked to a husband who called almost every day to ask if there was any news about his wife, who he was trying to hold on to as they both were holding on to a street sign, but they were both so tired and the current was too strong and she was washed away from his grip. He cried every time he called, and so did I. I talked to teenagers looking for their parents. I was able to connect one kid with his mom who they had gotten separated trying to get to the Superdome when she called crying, asking for the lady who helped her son find her. The whole call center stopped answering calls to listen in on the joy after they transferred her to me. And in fact, every time there was a good news call like that, the call agents would just stop talking. The whole call center would go silent and the call would be put on speaker so everybody could just listen to humanity being restored, even if it was just for a few minutes and a few far and in between short minutes, because it didn't happen often. I remember the calls to other relief agencies that I had to make in various states trying to get food, WIC cards, housing vouchers, clothes, medicine, to people stuck in hotels, places to stay after they got kicked out, scattered throughout various cities. And I remembered how at first people were eager to help. But then as time wore on, some people's tone became more and more resentful of the evacuees who some people openly asked me as I was on the phone asking them if they could help or if they knew anybody who, who could help, why those people didn't just go back home and start over. Now, I don't talk much about that time because honestly, I can't. There's a lot more to what I experienced and I just can't talk about it because it's hard to 
because I'm still haunted by those calls, really, really haunted. And I wonder all the time how those people are today. And I always pray that they're all right. But I can't help but think about that time these days as the unavoidable reality of climate change is creating more and more climate refugees. Aside from the never-ending imperialistic projects implemented by the U.S. government in the rest of the Americas that's propped up narco regimes and brutal bloodthirsty dictators that terrorize all who oppose them, it's been climate change that's driven people from their homes in Central American countries that has increased the immigration issue so far. People in this country have been able to ignore this reality because they've become adept at both climate denial, climate change denial, and xenophobia. But now the reality of climate change and the human flow of refugees it creates cannot be denied because there are more instances of climate refugees in this country right now. The evacuees from Lake Charles down in New Orleans right now having escaped with the clothes on their backs from one hurricane, only to be facing another on the way. There are the wildfires that have practically engulfed the entire state of California and have turned the sky in several neighboring states a hazy and dangerous red, making cities like San Francisco look like the set of Blade Runner. Then there are the storms this summer that pummeled the Midwest, including tornadoes that destroyed homes and small towns, severe weather that has been so wildly destructive and uncharacteristic in its frequency and severity that already underfunded states cannot keep up with the needs of the tens, if not hundreds of thousands of human beings whose lives have been shifted from citizens going on about their business to evacuate from their homes in the time it takes a wildfire to jump a mountain ridge. Now, I know that running away from a burning, flooding, climate-damaged world is not the answer. It's not possible. My little dream of my farm, Oasis, is an emotional respite for me. But it won't solve the climate crisis we're not just facing, but that we're in the midst of. And I also know that politicians in both parties are not going to do much about it because they are beholden to the companies, the fossil fuel companies that are responsible for this. And the companies responsible for climate change refuse to accept any moral or material responsibility for it themselves. So what do we human beings have left in our arsenal to save our ability to exist on the only home we have? The one weapon we have to fight everything else we are facing is the weapon we have to fight climate change and the disaster we are facing from it. We organize. We learn to rely on collective action and support for and with one another. And we do not shrink away from the continuing struggle against the people and the corporations who cause this problem before us. Because we're not fighting to save Mother Earth from climate change. We are fighting to save ourselves. Follow Luke Mon Nation on Patreon.com slash Luke Mon Nation for lots of great content. <laughs>